Hello, this is Dennis Polis with another Open Philosophy video. In this video, we are going to be discussing the problem of universals. It's the problem of what universal names actually mean. What do they refer to? Do they have a basis in reality? I started this video because a number of objections that I've received recently about my treatment of the laws of nature can be traced back to the nominalist tradition. Nominalism is one of the solutions to the problem of universals. But as I have begun recording the video, I have found that there is a moral dimension to the problem of universals which is far more important than its logical dimension. Bad solutions to the problem of universals undercuts the idea of a universal human nature with intrinsic rights. Bad solutions also undercut the value of individual differences. Many of the words we use apply to singular objects. They apply to John's and Mary's and this apple and that banana. And so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the word and what it means. But when we have universal words like humanity or fruit or words that apply to invisible objects like the laws of nature, there's a question about what we're really talking about. If we can't see it, is it real? And if it's not real, do the words referring to these universal and abstract objects mean nothing? So the problem of universals is the problem of what do universal words and ideas refer to in reality if indeed they refer to anything. Perhaps the first articulate solution proposed to this problem was that of Plato. Plato believed that just as John and Mary referred to individuals named John and Mary, so abstract ideas like humanity or seven or pi referred to individual ideas that existed in the so-called platonic world of ideas. If this idea seems very ancient and arcane, we need to remember that a number of mathematicians support this idea, among them the famous Roger Penrose. This raises a number of problems. The first is, how do the Marys, Johns, and Susies of our experience relate to the world of ideas? The answer is by a relationship which is called participation. Plato tried to explain this in his book, The Timaeus. In the Timaeus, he tells us that the ideas are like seals, which impress themselves on wax to make multiple copies. The differences between individuals are due to defects in the matter. In other words, the imperfections in the wax in which the ideas are impressed results in individuals varying in characteristics. One problem with this is that every mark of individuality is then a defect. A whole new set of problems emerges when we start considering the relationship between the world of ideas and ideas in individual human minds. How is it that we know the world of ideas? And then how is it that those ideas tell us anything about the actual world? In his dialogue Menno, Plato suggests that these ideas are impressed upon our soul before we are born. Then, when we encounter objects, those objects jog our memory and we recall the previously impressed ideas. The problem here is that when our memory is jogged, we can remember a lot of things which have nothing to do with the actual sensations that we have. For example, if I see an apple, I could remember a childhood of apple picking in an orchard that has nothing to do with the current situation. So, unless sensations are able to evoke the actual ideas that are relevant, unless seeing an apple is able to evoke the universal idea of apple or the universal idea of fruit, then it is irrelevant that it jogs my memory. But if it can evoke these universal ideas, then that is adequate for the universal idea to come to exist whether or not there is a platonic world of ideas. So the platonic world of ideas becomes largely irrelevant. In the metaphysics, Aristotle gives at least seven telling objections to Plato's theory of ideas. So if you're really interested, you can read Aristotle to find out precisely why it is that Plato's theory is incoherent. Roger Penrose has another theory. 
He suggests that there is an unknown quantum process, which he calls objective reduction, by which the world of ideas affects the quantum mechanics of our brain and impresses ideas. He applies this particularly to mathematical thinking. Penrose's theory is largely incoherent. One problem is, how does the world of ideas know which mathematical problem we are considering so that it can trigger the proper thoughts in us? Other problems with this theory are more technical. The brain has too high a temperature for the kind of quantum coherence that Penrose requires. And, when we examine neural processes, we find that quantum mechanics plays a very insignificant role. Another problem was noted by the Neoplatonists. They observed that ideas occur only in minds. Why is this? It's because ideas are not objects, they are actions. The idea apple is simply someone thinking of apples. The idea of seven is simply someone thinking of seven. So there cannot be a platonic world of crystalline ideas. To correct this, the Neoplatonists suggested that the ideas existed in the mind of God or in some godlike being. The ideas in the mind of God served as exemplars for creation. Individual humans were made according to the pattern in God's mind. The problem with this is that if there's one pattern, some people exemplify it better than others. And so some people are more fully human, while others are defective. People of different races, genders, sexual orientation, and so on, are less fully human than we are. Because, of course, we are perfect, while everyone else is defective. But that doesn't work either. The reason is simple. Ideas are abstractions. Abstractions are a human trick for simplifying complexity down to the scale where our limited intellects can deal with it. We can only think of five or six or seven chunks of information at one time. As a result, we focus on some notes of intelligibility to the exclusion of others. Of course, an omniscient being doesn't need to do that. An omniscient being doesn't need to exclude certain notes of intelligibility in order to focus on others because it understands all of reality in a single act. Thus, ideas cannot occur in isolation as crystalline ideas in a platonic world, nor does it make any sense to place them in the mind of God, who has no need of abstractions. Nominalism is the doctrine that universals are simply names that we give to collections of objects. It is the basis of current extensional logic, as opposed to the more classical intentional logic of Aristotle, but more about that later. Conceptualism is very similar. It says that universals are only concepts under which we collect sets of objects. Both nominalism and conceptualism deny that there is any basis in reality for universal ideas. Of course, this means that there can be no basis in reality for such things as human rights. The idea of human rights is simply a name or idea that humans create and apply in an arbitrary manner. When I say in an arbitrary manner, I mean that nominalism and conceptualism both say that names and ideas have no basis in reality, but are simply human creations. The problem with these doctrines is clear and easy to understand. If names are arbitrarily applied to collections of objects, then they certainly can only be applied on the basis of our past experience of objects. If we see a hundred human beings and decide to collect them together and call them human, then the name applies to those that we've actually seen and collected. Now suppose a new object comes along. How are we to decide whether or not to apply the same name, human? Indeed, how are we to decide whether or not to apply the word or concept object to it? Because none of our universal ideas, such as humanity or object, have any basis in reality. They are simply arbitrarily applied to collections of objects. So, when John comes along, I have no basis in reality to decide whether or not John is an object and whether or not John is human. Obviously, this doctrine is completely incompatible with our experience as human beings.
Still, despite its manifest inadequacy, despite its fallacious nature, this doctrine plays an essential role in modern philosophy. Analytical philosophy is based on the analysis of language rather than the analysis of existence. Modern logic is extensional rather than intentional. When I say that it's extensional, I mean that it's based on body counts, on collections of objects, rather than on meaning. For example, in modern logic, featherless biped and rational animal both mean the same thing. They are functionally equivalent because they apply to the same set of objects, namely human beings. But in intentional logic, they are certainly different because featherless is not the same genus as animal and biped is not the same specific difference as rational. The same thing applies to modal logic. In traditional intentional logic, necessity and possibility have well-defined meanings. But in modern logic, they have no well-defined meanings in themselves, and so to give them meaning, an entire structure of possible worlds needs to be created. Of course, these possible worlds have no objective existence. Their existence is merely subjective. In any one putatively possible world, we have no idea of whether or not such a world is really possible. Perhaps the laws of nature prevent such a world from ever being actualized. We're unable to tell because the entire construct of possible worlds is subjective. Besides which, how can we t talk about what worlds are possible unless we already know what possibility means? So extensional logic implicitly rests on intentional logic, but at the same time, it explicitly rejects intentional logic. To see this, let's look at how any scientific proposition is applied. If I say that all cases of a certain type are such that a given law of nature applies, I have to recognize that the case I'm dealing with is an instance of all cases of a specific type. If I can't recognize that, I can't apply the rules. So the application of all scientific principles rests on the Aristotelian syllogism in Barbara. Namely, all A is B, this is an A, therefore this is a B. Intentional Aristotelian logic is indispensable and fundamental. So, is there an explanation of universals which adequately reflects human experience? which adequately reflects how we know and use universals, and which avoids both the extremes of Platonism with its extreme realism and nominalism and conceptualism with their claim that our concepts of universals have no basis whatsoever in reality. Moderate realism claims that our universal ideas have a foundation in reality, but do not exist in reality. And this is exactly what we experience. When we see an apple, it evokes the idea of apple within us. It has the objective power to evoke that idea within us. When we see a human being, it has the objective power to evoke the idea of humanity within us. Neither apples nor humans are ideas, and neither apples nor humans contain their universal ideas, unless the particular human that we're looking at happens to be thinking about humanity. Ideas don't occur in the objective world. They occur in the subjective world as a result of our interactions with the objective world. We saw in previous videos how objects are able to inform us about their essences. Recall that essences specify which possible acts objects are capable of performing. When they perform one of these acts on us, then we are informed that they are able to do that act. That is the basis in reality of the concepts that we form. By having objects act on us, they inform us that they are able to do this, that, and the other thing, and so we form an idea of what they are, of what they are capable of doing.
So our abstract and universal ideas have a basis in reality without actually occurring in reality. The only reality they occur in is thinking minds. Of course, this does not deny a role to culture. We learn our ideas from our culture, we are educated, and in any given historical era and culture, we have different sets of ideas than people in other eras and other cultures. The Chinese have a concept of qi that we don't have. We have a concept of mass that didn't exist in the time of Aristotle and Plato, and so on. Despite the fact that we learn concepts from our culture, those concepts have a basis in reality. We can recognize instances of mass, and Chinese can recognize instances of qi, and they can distinguish qi experiences from experiences which do not involve qi. So culture plays a role in educating and sensitizing us to various concepts, but those concepts still have a foundation in reality. An understanding of universal ideas, which does not involve a single prototype, as Platonism does, and which bases them in reality, unlike conceptualism and nominalism, provides a foundation for a human understanding of the world. Because there is no single prototype, human diversity does not mean that some humans are more perfectly human than others. Rather, each individual can be perfectly human in himself while being different in many ways from his fellow humans. That does not make him or her imperfect. And, unlike nominalism, who is human is not a matter of our subjective opinion. There is an objective basis in reality for the idea of humanity. People are objectively human. We can't simply exclude classes of people because it doesn't suit our political convenience, because it doesn't serve our objectives. Everyone who is able to evoke the idea of humanity is objectively human. So only moderate realism provides us with an adequate foundation for an ethical and moral society, for a free and just society. Thank you for watching. I look forward to your comments.